Lara mentioned my name is James and I work for the Extension Office here in Pinellas County. And I have full confession, I'm not an ornithologist by training. I'm actually a botanist, but I love watching birds and I just wanna share today with you uh, some of the things that I've learned um, after growing up in Pinellas County, spending a lot of time at the beach and observing some of these wonderful birds that we have here in the state. Lara did mention that all of these are available to watch on our YouTube channel, and I wanted to call attention to one. Uh, we did a who's who on Florida's wading birds. So that's a group of birds that you might see around water that we're not going to be covering today. But just if this was a particular group that you were dying to hear about, you can always go back and watch a pre-recorded webinar on that topic. So today's topic, shorebirds and moorbirds. Um, Obviously, they're adorable, and they're beloved by very many people who uh, visit our beaches throughout the year. But there's a technical term, shorebirds. It's not a catch-all for everything that lives at the beach. The shorebirds belong to a few groups of bird families. The oyster catchers, the plovers, and the sandpipers. These are what are considered technically the shorebirds. A lot of information, or some of the information for today's presentation, uh, which is primarily focused on the identification of these different groups of birds, uh, is found in the Shorebird Guide. Uh, this is very comprehensive. It is um, based on IDing the silhouettes and the feather patterns and the behaviors. So more than just a drawing of a bird with arrows pointing to different things, um, it's very comprehensive and very useful. It's definitely worth checking out of the library um, and having a go with. So the more birds that we'll be looking at, other birds that are found at our beaches and coastlines would be the family called the Laridae, which includes the gulls, the terns, and the skimmers. So here we have our first poll question, and Lara's gonna launch you a multiple choice question to answer, do you know what this bird is? Um, is it a minor bird? Is it a sandpiper? Is it an American oyster catcher? Or is it a seagull? It's got this very uh, distinctive orange beak. It has jet black head and black back. You might even see the distinctive white stripe across the forewing and a white belly. So giving you a chance to vote, everybody's weighing in. Y'all are really good. Y'all are really quick at answering. That's great because you know when we're waiting for answers, it's kind of awkward. So I'm seeing we're at over 90% and it looks like just about everyone has figured out that this one is the American oyster catcher. And you can insert a joke here about an oyster catcher. I mean, how hard is it to catch an oyster? You know, they're like cemented. Um, but the oyster catcher is a, a permanent resident. Others of the species that we'll see today are only around during the winter. It's threatened in the state, so it's a, it's a state listed bird. And we're going to talk about some of the reasons that these um, these species that are found on our shore are so imperiled. Um, they are strictly intertidal. That means they they will not be found anywhere but the shoreline because they have a beak that is specifically adapted to opening bivalves. That is things like oysters and clams and other bivalve mollusks. Uh, it's flattened from side to side and it uses that as kind of a prize to pull the different valves apart. And in feeding, uh, it is able to extract the soft-bodied mollusks, of course, that, which there are many at the shore. Uh, they're found, like other shorebirds, um, right on the sand. Uh, their young are referred to as precocial. That means when they hatch out of their egg, they're up and running. They're not stuck in a nest uh, waiting to be fed. They're actually up and running and able to um, receive the food from their parents. So that's the American oyster catcher, very dramatic bird um, and easy to identify with that bright red beak. Another family of the shorebirds includes the plovers, and this is called the semi-palmated plover. This is one that we see mostly during the winter months, starting, uh, ornithologists refer to winter as starting in August here in Florida. So after breeding in the subarctic region, which is, of course, just 
northern Canada and and um, Alaska, these birds find their way back to our counties, our, our coastal counties, to spend the winter feeding. Here's a picture of the bird in breeding plumage. So this picture was actually taken in Alaska on the breeding grounds, and you can see the bright red ring around the neck and a bright, I mean, a bright black, that's really good, a very distinctive black ring around the neck and a distinctive kind of mask of black through the eyes. It's referred to as semi-palmated because its little feet are just barely webbed. So that's what that means. We're more likely to see a bird in this plumage, um, the winter plumage. It's a little bit less showy, but it's still quite distinctive with that uh, black ring around the neck. Uh, this bird is about the size of a cardinal, if you're familiar with that, but obviously without the uh, bright red colors and ornamentations, and much longer legs. The shorebirds have these uh, long legs uh, adapted to uh, wading around in the water where they extract various uh, marine worms, crustaceans, just about anything. The semi-palmated plover does very, very well and his numbers are very high because it has such a varied diet. Whereas the oyster catcher was specialized for marine bivalves, the little uh, semi-palmated will eat just about anything. Plovers have short, stumpy beaks. Uh, that's obvious here. Also in the another plover, a larger plover. This one's about the size of a gallinule or, or the water chickens that you see um, on the sides of freshwater areas. Um, the this black-bellied plover also has that uh, short, stocky beak that it uses to probe the sand uh, for various prey species, like the crustaceans and the um, uh, marine worms. Uh, this is how we you normally see the black-bellied plover during the winter months. So this is its winter plumage, um, and it doesn't look very much like a black-bellied plover in this stage. But the males in breeding season, uh, their, their appearance changes quite dramatically. And we can see uh, this plumage uh, during the early, early migration um, for these birds where they overwinter here in the winter, overwinter here. And um, we, they might still have their breeding plumage on, so to speak. So, uh, but throughout the winter months, they would molt into this more uh, subdued patterning, um, acting more as camouflage than advertisement for a mate. And here you can see that short beak being put to good use and snacking on a native marine crab. The sandpipers, by contrast, have longer beaks. And um, here we have the spotted sandpiper. Uh, this is one that's uncommon, but it's easy to identify, so I included it. The spotted sandpiper, again, this is winter plumage, so there's not really many spots uh, available or, or obvious. Um, but the longer beak uh, identifies it as a sandpiper at the shore. And the spotted sandpiper is distinctive in that it, it hangs out by itself. Uh, a lot of these other shorebirds will be found in small flocks feeding together. Uh, the spotted sandpiper tends to be very uh, solitary and it has a very distinctive uh, wag. It, it dips its tail as it walks along. So it's almost like it's hesitating. It's, it's a funny looking thing when it's walking along the shore. Uh, likes to feed in the rack line, which is the, where the seaweed has washed ashore. The uh, spotted sandpiper is also a species of concern because of its, uh, we're losing the habitat that it requires during the overwintering months. Our shorelines here on the Gulf Coast. The most common of our sandpipers is the willet. And this is a larger bird. This one's about the size of a duck. But again, it has a very long bill that it uses to probe for uh, the, the typical marine prey species. can also catch fish. Um, it gets its name willet from the song that it makes. Uh, it, it's more like a cry than a song uh, on the wing. Uh, pill will willet. And when it flies, it flashes these very bright white wing bars. And those are kind of its um, advertisement for a mate. Uh, the, the better the wing bars, the more likely you might be to uh, attract a mate. So that's the willet. This is another year round here in uh, 
Gulf Coast of Florida. A very small one of our sandpipers is called the ruddy turnstone. And ruddy means reddish. So the ruddy turnstone, here it is in its uh, winter plumage. So this is a small shorebird, very tucked in, but note the bright orange legs and the very mottled feathering on the back. Um, it does have something of a suggestion of a collar, but nothing as extreme as the semi-palmated that we met earlier, although it's a, a similar size. But it has a much longer pointier beak than the, than the semi-palmated plover that had that short little beak. We see them in various plumages. Uh, when they're in breeding season, they, have, they really live up to that um, ruddy definition with bright red brown feathers across the back. Uh, and here's kind of an intermediary in between breeding and winter plumage, but you can still see some of those reddish uh, feathers. And thankfully they tend to hang out in groups and there's usually at least one in the group that's displaying some of that uh, reddish coloration you can see on this bird just here, whereas others have, have finished molting into that winter. Uh, this picture not taken in Florida, you can see this is a rocky beach. They're found throughout uh, the Eastern North America, uh, but they are also one of the species that nests um, in the Arctic area. So they're long, long distance migrants. If I'm allowed, um, this would be my favorite, uh, the Sanderling. These guys are hilarious. They're very, very small. They are about, they're smaller than a dove. They're kind of the size of a, of a um, tufted titmouse, if you're familiar with that. Almost like a sparrow, if you're familiar with sparrows. Very small shorebirds, and they, they're nonstop runners. Uh, they chase the receding waves as they uh, pull off the beach and pick up the organisms that might have risen to the surface. And then as the waves return, they run back and, and they run away from the waves as they um, advance up the shoreline. This is the bird that's featured. This is likely the bird that's featured in the short Pixar movie, um, Piper. And we're gonna send you a link to that just because it's so, it's very entertaining and it's very well done. It's very um, scientifically correct. So those are the sanderlings, uh, always in these large groups, uh, just around during the winter. So they, they arrive in September and they're here till about May. So if you do visit the beaches during the winters on lovely days, do look for these birds uh, running back and forth away from the waves. Now we're gonna have another poll question. So thank you again for your uh, responses. The next poll question is, where do most shorebirds nest? Would that be in trees? Would it be directly on the beach? Would it be at sea or D, golf courses? So we're having, I'm watching the count up to percentage voting, doing really good. 70, we're at 74, 77. I guess some of y'all are having your lunch at your desk and maybe your hands are busy uh, with your lunch. Very good. All right, we have consensus that these birds nest on the beach and that's absolutely correct. And that uh, speaks to their conservation status. Uh, nesting directly on the beach has its advantages. You can, uh, the, the birds that are nesting on the beach in these large colonies uh, can overwhelm predators in number. Uh, the sheer volume, you know, if a couple of nests are lost, it's no big deal. But that's historic. Modern pressures, which include humans that want to occupy the same beach and can disrupt nesting colonies, um, loose pets uh, that might be running up and down the beach chasing a frisbee uh, might decide that the, a little bird snack might be more fun. Um, also, the fact that our sea level is rising and the, beaching er the beach areas are actually shrinking uh, with development, uh, pushing, putting pressure closer and closer to the shore. All these things together kind of add up to uh, imperiling some of these shorebirds. Um, there are volunteers that uh, watch over bird nesting colonies. They're actually active right now. Uh, a big 
problem this year, uh, not only Labor Day, which is peak nesting season for the shorebirds, but we also had, of course, the tropical storm. So even natural disasters can negatively impact uh, shorebird colonies. And um, if you'd like to get involved, uh, do research. And if you'd like to send me an email, if you're in Pinellas County, I can get you in touch with uh, the volunteer coordinator who trains you on how to um, inform the public. Uh, the, the, the beach nesting stewards, as they're called, they don't yell at people. They just uh, uh, educate them on why it's important that we leave these uh, nesting bird colonies alone. So that's it for the shorebirds writ large. And now we're gonna move on to some more birds, the larids, the gulls, the terns, and the skimmers. And if you live here in the Gulf Coast, you probably recognize this one, uh, certainly during the breeding season with the big black head and the loud voice. This is the laughing gull that we'll meet in a bit. But not just the gulls in this family, there's also a group of birds related called the terns and one called the skimmer. The terns are gull-like, but they're much more graceful in the air. They have forked tails and their beaks are much longer, giving them a much pointier appearance. They tend to hover and then dive for their food, which is fish swimming near the surface, whereas gulls tend to scavenge food on the shore, and they don't have that diving, piercing uh, bill that the terns do. Our largest tern, uh, which is here, uh, again, mostly during the winter, is the royal tern. And this one is easy to recognize by that bright orange bill. This one is out of breeding plumage, but it still has that bright orange bill and it's a large tern. You can see that it's, and it also has the black crest. Here in breeding plumage, you can see the, the very graceful wings. Uh, you might just be able to, to tell the, um, the forked tail just here. And that, of course, that bright orange bill leading the way. Here's a pair considering each other in their breeding plumage with that bright black, I did it again, bright black, dark black crest. And you'll note on these individuals' legs, these have been tagged. Shorebirds are studied uh, quite extensively um, for their population dynamics and especially those that migrate great distances. So uh, a, a record is kept of where individuals go and when and how the numbers um, compare year to year on breeding success and all these sorts of things. So that's the royal turn. Another crested turn is the sandwich turn. Uh, this one has recently been given a new name uh, from it's moved from Sandwich to Cabot's turn. Uh, sandwich refers to uh, an area of England where this species exists, but uh, scientists have decided that our population in North America is distinct enough to be given uh, its own subspecies, Acuflavidus, um, but they both have the distinctive yellow tip to their bill. And the way that most people learn this is that the sandwich turn has its beak dipped in mustard. And you can see this distinctive from the royal turn, which has the bright orange bill. This is black with that little tip. And you can even see uh, that tip without binoculars. So this one is pretty easy to recognize um, when it's flying. It's slightly smaller than the royal turn. Uh, but it's still big for a turn and um, has that distinctive uh, beak tip. Here it is backlit, showing that, um, that uh, yellow spot on this species of turn. The least turn is the smallest of the turns, and this one is particularly endangered. This one is um, considered endangered uh, because of its loss of nesting habitat. So that leads us to our next poll question, which is tr a true or false. So this one you can, you can get pretty quickly. True or false, least terns have been known to nest on flat rooftops. 
give that a thought. <clears throat> yep, you got it. Lee's turns have discovered that flat rooftops that are often covered in gravel um, to provide a reflective surface and, and ease the, the heat gain uh, on a particular building, large buildings, we're talking like warehouses or uh, uh, the main buildings that perhaps car lots, uh, the least turns, they recognize the surface of those rocky rooftops and uh, as similar to the beaches and the rocky shores where they're used to nesting, and they've also noticed that there are much fewer predators up there. The problem with nesting on the rooftop, of course, is that the little precocial chicks that you see here, so like we said before, they hatch and they're ready to run around, they might run off the edge of the building. And so where least turn populations have been reported to be nesting, there's another group of volunteers that are called chick checkers. And they will circle the building each day, uh, not the same person every day, uh, it's done in shifts, looking for these little chicks that might have uh, either tumbled down a downspout, down a, dra uh, 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 a, a drain pipe, or that might have actually walked off the side of the building and hit the ground. And thankfully these guys are kind of bouncy um, and they usually survive. And with a special long pole with a little basket at the tip um, called a chickaboom, uh, the chicks are replaced back on the roof. And believe it or not, the parent and the chick can find each other even if they've been separated like that. So that's the least turn. The forester's turn is kind of in between the size of the sandwich turn and the least turn. So it's a small turn and it's got that uh, good burglar's mask and uh, bright orange legs. Uh, it's pretty distinctive, pretty common, the forester's turn. Here it is in its winter plumage and here it is in its breeding plumage, those bright orange legs. So before we move on to the gulls and talking about uh, the, the perils of beach nesting, we have our final poll question, which uh, has to do with beach nesting birds, and see how many of these you think apply to helping our native shorebirds during nesting season. Um, which of these activities do you think would help in that endeavor to, to help our um, beach nesting birds during these critical times. Keeping dogs off the beach, um, obeying po posted nesting site signs, uh, volunteering to be a bird steward or a, or a chick checker, um, picking up trash and debris uh, when leaving. Which of these do you think would be important? We're getting good response, good job. I'm going to get a sip of water while we're waiting. All right, I think y'all figured me out. It's true. All of these are important uh, actions during uh, beach nesting bird seasons, especially um, the part about keeping the dogs off the beach. I know it's uh, sometimes contentious uh, when you try and approach people and, and mention that their dog might not be allowed in a particular area. Um, people can get quite emotional about that, but it's true, the, um, the, just the presence of the dog, even if it's on a leash, uh, can, can scare the birds uh, because they see that animal as a, a, a real predator. So we'll finish up with a couple of gulls. We do get quite a lot of different species of gulls during the winter, um, and it's a real it's really difficult to tell them apart. So we're just gonna focus on the two uh, of our resident gulls that you'll see year round in breeding plumage, which helps uh, identify them and out of breeding plumage. This of course is the laughing gull. This one to me, when I hear this bird start to make its, uh, its laughing call, I know it must be spring break uh, because it's springtime when these like other shorebirds are going into their nesting season and they sure can make a lot of noise. The laughing gulls uh, nest in the sand dunes 
And um, those, of course, are, are very attractive to uh, young beachgoers to, to climb up in the beach dunes. So you might see when you're at the Gulf Coast beaches, signs that say, please keep off the dunes. And it's uh, not only to preserve the integrity of the dunes themselves, which protect the beach, but also for the birds that nest there. The laughing gull in breeding season, obvious with that uh, black head. I'm not going to say bright black this time. And the uh, black legs that trail behind in flight. And pretty uniform covered, colored underwings. In the winter, they look pretty much like every other gull in the winter. So we, we in the person of me don't really uh, try to identify many gulls during the winter. Some of the larger ones that come down are, are easy, but otherwise... We just say, look at all those gulls. The other one of our permanent resident gulls is the ring-billed gull. And it does us the great favor of having a ringed bill uh, living up to its name, just like the laughing gull during breeding season uh, laughs or sounds like laughter uh, giving its mating call. So the ring-billed gull in its breeding plumage, uh, we decided looks a little evil, um, like... I want your French fries. Um, again, gulls, unlike terns, are more scavengers than active hunters. And they will tend to uh, sit on the surface of the water and paddle around, whereas terns are less likely to ever be seen sitting. So if you see a group of these birds in the distance, it's much more likely to be gulls than terns. And our final Larid, and we're going to leave this presentation with arguably the coolest bird in the world, uh, is the black skimmer. So this odd looking bird is actually quite graceful, very long pointed wings, uh, distinctive black uh, coloration across the upper parts and bright white beneath. And I'm sure you can't help but notice the color and the shape of that unusual bill. It's called a skimmer because it actually uses that longer, lower bill to skim along the surface of the water until its very sensitive uh, nerve endings that are found bump into a fish and it immediately snaps shut. Uh, so this is an extremely graceful bird, much more active at dawn and dusk when the waters are calmer and the fish are closer to the surface. Uh, they'll also can be found uh, skimming in freshwater areas, but they do, they are some of our uh, shorebird nesters. Uh, the, the nests here in Pinellas County were severely impacted by our recent tropical storm, and they're actually trying to start over. They're uh, trying to start new scrapes is what these uh, nests are called that are directly on the ground. So that's just a brief uh, 101 introduction to some of our wonderful shorebirds. I want to thank you for joining us today, and I want to thank Lara and Shannon again for allowing me to present today. Um, if you've had questions mounting up, I'd be happy to answer those in a bit. Uh, but otherwise, I'll sign off for now and hand it back to Lara. Here from Sarah, asking about roseate spoonbills, which we didn't cover in this one, but we do cover in that Waiting Birds webinar that James did for us last year. Um, but she was asking, do roseate spoonbills live or forage on beaches? Yes, they do. They, they are quite happy in freshwater and saltwater. And they actually nest out uh, in rookeries with those other wading birds uh, over the saltwater areas. So they can be found, they, they will nest in, um, in cypress trees in freshwater, but they're 99% gonna be found nesting in marine areas. Awesome. Now the questions are coming in. Okay, and then we have a question from Tim asking, can you find most of these shorebirds, I'm assuming the ones that we just covered along the East Coast? Yes, the answer is yes. Um, the, uh, the migrants, especially the long distance migrants, they uh, find their way uh, all around the Gulf Coast, um, all the way up to North and South Carolina. Apparently that, that climate is, is warm enough compared to the subarctic. So yes, you can find these all around. The, the southeast, but just just hugging the coast during the winter months. Okay, and then speaking of winter, 
Um, Carol was asking if any, if you have any tips on telling the various sandpipers apart in the winter. Ha. Huh. Um, beyond the few that we looked at today, uh, even experienced birders, when they see large uh, rafts, they're called, of these birds, simply refer to them as peeps. And you can see that they are different, but maybe not unless you really, really study. Um, it takes a long time to learn the peeps apart. And so that's why the ones that we met today did have the distinguishing characteristics that I hope I um, conveyed in, in helping identify these different peeps during the, during the winter months. Perfect. Yeah, peeps. I love it. Yeah, I'll probably be going back and watching this recording several times to get the sandpipers down. <laughs> Good excuse to go to the beach or wherever exactly. you can find the shorebirds, inland, yes. east coast. Okay, and then Caitlin asked, we have many shorebirds running around in our parking lot in the wintertime. It is gravel. Should we worry about them nesting there? Not during the winter. They're not nesting during the winter. They, um, the the long-distance migrants uh, nest, like I, like I mentioned, up in Canada and around the North Pole. Our native shorebird um, that nest that are resident and nest here that's in the springtime so that's you know like i said it, it peaks around um memorial day so you shouldn't have to worry about those in your parking lot and the the shorebirds that um you see inland are the killdeer which we left out because um although they're related to the sandpipers and they share a lot of similarities with the sandpipers they are found in inland areas and maybe that's who you have running around in your uh, gravel parking lot. Not to worry. All right. And then we have another question from Sarah asking if we have archives of the webinar so we can watch the waiting bird webinar. Um, and the answer, Sarah, is yes, we do. Um, Shannon, I believe, has already, yeah, she's pushed out the link in the chat box. So if you click on that little chat icon, it should be lighting up orange if you haven't opened it already. Um, it's on our YouTube channel. All of our past webinars are on there. Um, and we'll also be sending it out via email if you're not able to access this chat for some reason. Okay, and then Tim asked, what kind of nesting materials do shorebirds use? That's a great question and, and thanks for bringing it up. Uh, I did mention that the quote unquote nest is called a scrape and it's basically just a, a hollow uh, very, very, uh, they don't actually collect nesting material. Uh, the willet does collect nesting material, uh, seagrasses and things like that. But all these nests are basically just um, the sand pushed away and a small depression made. So most of these birds lay their eggs directly on the sand. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, and then we have a question from Liza about um, what can we feed gulls we see around parking areas, et cetera? That's an easy question to answer. <laughs> Nothing. Um, it is not advisable to feed um, any wildlife whatsoever with the exception of a backyard feeder uh, as long as you keep that feeder clean and change the seed out uh, and uh, wash it once a week. Uh, it's a good way, uh, putting out bird feeders is a good way to help spread disease if they're not kept sanitary. But otherwise, uh, feeding wildlife is actually prohibited. And although they, it might be fun, um, especially for little kids to let this wildlife come up close, it's not recommended and it's not good for the animals. So I'm glad you asked the question, thank you. Yeah, and um, there's actually a really good publication through UF's EDIS, the EDIS publication um, titled, Why Shouldn't We Feed Water Birds? So Shannon um, just pushed that link out in the chat box and I'll be sure to include that one in the follow-up email as well. And that wraps up the questions here, which is perfect timing because I have that it's 12.59 and we want to respect your time and end at um, one o'clock. So this is just our last si slide. Shannon is now going to open up the chat box if you guys want to leave any comments 
um, for James or about the webinars or any future webinar topics that you would like to request. Um, we're always thinking ahead to next year. And then please, if you enjoyed this webinar, be sure to register for future webinars. The link is on your screen. Shannon will also push that out. And again, the next one is second Wednesday in July on ducks in Central Florida. So thank you so much to James for an awesome presentation on shorebirds and more birds. And Shannon and I will see you guys hopefully in July. So thanks so much and have a great day.